Hello everyone, welcome to the next series of lectures. I am going to start this lecture on the topic of nanoscience and nanotechnology. This will be a very short uh, lecture which will be divided into two. So I have considered only the syllabus for the Dhanan Sagar University B.Tech program and the references for this is the different engineering physics textbooks yeah, which are there in India and uh, especially the DSU edition of Wiley and Pearson publications. So I start the nano science and nanotechnology lecture with this uh, very funny slide. So uh, this obviously brings some curiosity into the minds of students. So they would have learned about nano as a car or a uh, audio system, uh, audio player, or maybe in some movies, some Hollywood movies, they would have heard about it. So, but yeah, the only thing in which nano science or nanotechnology would have been talked about to some extent would have been the movies, but obviously the in a parts of the audio player would also be implementing some of the technology and just imagine how uh, an audio player which was used to be very bigger in size has come to such a smaller size and, and the sensitivity has improved so well that you prefer to use such a small device. Okay, so starting with what is a nano science? So a simple definition goes like study of phenomena and manipulation of materials at the nano scale. Basically understanding the different physical phenomena which happens when the materials are in nano scale. That means in the size of order of nanometers of a few nanometers. Uh, this science is actually an interdisciplinary science which involves different fields like biology, chemistry, physics, medicine, material science and obviously engineering. Now let's understand what is nanotechnology. So nanotechnology is obviously when you make use of the different nano science, you implement the science you want and try to make the materials. So creation of useful or functional materials, devices and systems through control of matter on the nanometer length scale. So obtaining materials by ways of some physical or chemical processes and have them on the size of the order of nano scale. You can also say that exploitation of novel phenomena and different properties like physical, chemical and biological at this length scale can also be helpful to satisfy human needs, different human needs. So different applications are possible with the products created using nanotechnology. So a few simple examples are uh, the uh, creation of nanomaterials which are used in integrated circuits, that's ICs, data storage mechanisms or medical device industry to make smaller products. Now this is a figure to show a simple comparison of size. So when we understand nano scale or nanometer scale, we define it in the range of 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer. We keep 1 nanometer as a minimum so that we don't include single atoms or very small group of atoms. If you understand what is a single atom, you know that the diameter is of, of the order of a femtometer. Even if I consider many number of single atoms and join them together, it will be still very smaller, the size will be very much smaller than a nanometer. So we are basically avoiding single atoms or a cluster of atoms. Hence, we obtain a minimum size of 1 nanometer. If we even have clusters of atoms, then we limit it to the size of 1 nanometer. So let's look into a few examples. So this is a meter scale which goes from uh, meters to uh, the nano level. And you start with a football which has a circumference of around 22 centimeter. 
Then you can see I have given an insect here. This insect or flea which is of size 1 millimeter. Next comes our human hair. The diameter of human hair is just of the order of micrometers, 80 micrometers. Much smaller than the human hair is the red blood cell or RBCs in our blood which uh, is of the order of 7 micrometer. Next comes our virus, yeah, something like the coronavirus, the other influenza virus and other stuff. So we have of the order of 150 nanometer as a size. Now, yes, so we are slowly entering towards the nano scale which we have defined here at the beginning. So next we have tin dioxide in sunscreen which we use the sunscreen lotion which is of the order of 35 nanometers. Then we have the DNA strands, this is a famous DNA structure and the thickness of the DNA strand is of the order of 2 nanometers. And this is something called as Bucky ball, basically carbon 60, 60, carbon 60 molecule which is actually made up of many number of nano wires we call them as nano wires it's like a mix so this is of the order of 0.8 nanometer so we are come close to one nanometer in this particular case now how do we classify nano materials so suppose i consider a bulk material in three dimensions so all three dimensions x y and z are length breadth and height so what I am going to do is I start with this lower one that is say I reduce the dimension one in one direction by less than 100 nanometer. So if I reduce it to nanoscale in one direction or that means one dimension one of the dimensions become less than 100 nanometer then I will get a structure like this. My bulk material has been now reduced to like this. So th this is like you can see that this is like a film or a layer of a substance. So you call it as nanofilm or thin film or a thin layer or a thin coating. Now next if I reduce in two dimensions by in less than 100 nanometer or in two directions you have reduced the size to nanoscale you will get something like a long tube. It's just a tube here, tube or a wire or you call it as nanotube or nano wire or nano fiber. What if all the dimensions are less than 100 nanometer? That means in all the three directions you have reduced the size of the material to less than 100 nanometer or you brought it to the nano scale. You might be able to spot a dot here, a yellow dot here. So this is known as a nanoparticle or a quantum dot or nano dot or nano shell or nano ring, micro capsules. All these are of examples of the case where you have all the three dimensions in less than 100 nanometer or all the material has been reduced in all three directions to the nano scale. Now let's next understand the scaling laws in miniaturization. So before understanding what is scaling laws, obviously you need to know what is this term miniaturization. So miniaturization like it's just like basic in English if you think of, it's just the process of manufacturing smaller mechanical, optical and electronic products. So it's just a method in which you are going to produce very small products. The advantages of miniaturization or advantage of having materials in smaller size is that say if you have something of a smaller size then it can move or stop very quickly. Something of less mass will be able to stop very quickly because of low mechanical inertia. Hence it is ideal for precise movements and rapid actuation. Now next we have another advantage as less thermal distortion and mechanical vibration. That means for change in temperature you don't have much variation or any kind of vibration happening to the material 
it will not affect much. So this makes it suitable for biomedical and aerospace applications. So just uh, a simple example I can quote here in case of aerospace applications um, like you have all these satellites which go in a launch vehicle to the space. So the launch vehicle you would have seen in the video or the images that there is a lot of heat generated and also there is lots of vibration happening when the launch is about to start. So if you have smaller materials of the order of nano size then it can withstand the vibration very easily. And uh, even temperature variations say once a satellite reaches into the space temperature variations go like anything. So you do have different kinds of temperature, different environment which it comes through. So all those the nano size materials will be able to withstand. So uh, something similar I have mentioned in the next one that is higher dimensional stability at high temperature due to low thermal expansion. And then uh, something which you can think of is like this that if you have something of a very small size then obviously it doesn't need a lot of space. So less space requirement is one advantage that means you can have more components within a single device. You can have many number of nano components in a single device. Once again less material requirement for production and transportation. So this is very very easy low cost of production and transportation. So material required to produce a small materials will be uh, small si nano size devices will be very less. You don't have to implement much. But uh, uh, although it is low cost of production, the technology is actually a bit complicated. So we will come into the technology later. Now let's understand what is scaling loss. So we understood miniaturization. Let's understand scaling loss. So scaling loss are basically proportionality relations of any parameter associated with an object or a system with its length scale. So basically if you think of this, you are say you have an object or a system and you are trying to reduce the size. So what uh, happens to the different properties, different parameters associated with this object or system when the size is being reduced. So how say if I reduce the size by uh, in its length scale say I this for an example example if I say I reduce something of a 1 meter to 1 nanometer. That means I am reducing the size in its length scale. So I am going to consider the length scale with the letter L and I am going to set up some relations of different parameters associated with the object or system. Now scaling laws are of two types. So first we understand the first type that is the scaling in geometry, scaling laws in geometry which actually refers to the different physical size of objects. So this will be very easier for you to understand because you already learned about geometry a lot in mathematics. So the first parameter to consider is the perimeter of the object or the material. So perimeter is what is perimeter? Perimeter is just referring to the total length. So you can say that the perimeter P will be proportional, directly proportional to the length scale L. So that means if I reduce the length scale, the perimeter also reduces by the same amount or the same factor. What happens to area? So area of a rectangle, you know it is length into breadth. Area of a square is square of the one side. And then you have, even if you consider a sphere or a circle, every time it comes as square, right? So you can say that area will be proportional to the square of the length. That means if I reduce the length say by a factor of 10, then the area will reduce by a factor of 100. What happens to volume? Now you have three dimensions. Volume will have three dimensions, length, breadth into height. So it will be proportional to cube of the length scale. As an example, if I reduce the length by a factor of 10, then the volume reduces by 
L cube that is 10 cube or 1000. So all these are directly proportional. Perimeter, area and volume are directly proportional but just that the factor is different. First you have directly proportional to L, next you have L square then you have L cube. Now we are going to have a very important relation with respect to the size of the object that is the surface to volume ratio. So if I find the surface area, so surface area is again like area. So surface area will be proportional to square of the length scale. Volume we have proportional to cube of the length scale. What if I take ratio of surface area by volume that is S by V. So if I do S by V, I will get L square by L cube that is 1 by L or L power minus 1. That means it's an inverse relation now. So what happens? If I reduce the size of the material, then surface by volume ratio or surface to volume ratio is going to increase. This is a very important aspect of nano science. Surface to volume ratio increases as you reduce the size of the material. Say if I reduce it by a factor of 10, if L is reduced by a factor of 10, then obviously surface by volume ratio is going to increase by the same amount. Okay, now let's look into the second type of scaling laws that is scaling of phenomenological behavior that is when you consider both size and material characterizations or basically the different physical properties of the different materials we are going to consider. So let's start with electrical parameters. So different electrical parameters which you have already learned. So we start with the simplest that is resistance, capacitance and inductance. LCR, so R is the resistance and you know the formula for resistance as resistivity rho into length of the wire divided by area of cross section. So R is equal to rho L divided by A. Now let's bring in the proportionality relations. So in this case, we have to consider the proportionality relation for length and area. So length obviously will be directly proportional to the power of 1, so L power 1. Area we just found that it is L power 2, so it becomes L power 2. So for resistance we can write the scaling law as L power 1 by L power 2 or that is L power minus 1 or R is equal to 1 by L. So it's 1 by L, the variation is going to happen as 1 by L. That means if I reduce the size of the material, resistance is going to increase because it is inversely proportional to the length scale. Next we have the formula for capacitance say C is equal to epsilon A by D or if you consider free space then it becomes C naught is equal to epsilon naught A divided by D where epsilon or epsilon naught refers to the permittivity. A is the area, area of the parallel plate capacitor is the distance between the plates. Let's bring in the relation. So area is proportional to L square and the D distance is proportional to L to the power of 1. So we get L square by L or that is L to the power of plus 1. So what happens here? It's a directly proportional relation which is having the power of 1. So if I reduce the size of the material then the capacitance also is going to reduce by the same amount or the same factor. Next we have inductance value. So inductance obviously you know it's for different coils. So you have mu n square a divided by l. Mu is the permeability. Mu or mu naught if you consider as free space then it is a permeability. N is the number of turns. A is area of cross section. L is the length of the coil. So what we need to consider here is area and length. So area is proportional to L square and length is proportional to L power 1. So L square by L we get it as L. Again a directly proportional relation that means you reduce the size of the material by some factor then the inductance also reduces by the same amount. Next we consider the time constant RC for a capacitor 
So this is just a product of resistance and capacitance values. So what we have to do is we have already found the relation for resistance and capacitance. We just need to bring them here. So resistance we know it is L power minus 1 and capacitance is L. So let's substitute. So it becomes L power minus 1 into L power 1 or that is L power 0 which basically means there is not going to be any change for the time constant R into C if you reduce the size of the material. Next we have power, power generated so you can give it as V square by R and you have R here and R is in the denominator so R is L power minus 1 so this becomes 1 divided by L power minus 1 or L to the power of plus 1. That means if you reduce the size by whatever factor the power also reduces by the same amount. Next let's consider energy density. So this is the formula for energy density if you consider the case of capacitors or LC circuits we have learned all these. So we have half epsilon naught or half epsilon into E square. How do we do this? So we have not yet got any relation for E that is the electric field. So but you know that electric field is equal to potential divided by distance. Electric potential divided by distance or V divided by D. So just substitute it here. So you get D square in the denominator. D is the distance. So distance is directly proportional to the length or it becomes 1 divided by L square. The proportional relation will be 1 divided by L square or L power minus 2. That means if I reduce the size by a factor of 10, what is going to happen? The energy density is going to vary as 1 divided by L square. That means 1 divided by 100. So basically if I reduce the size of the material it is the energy density is going to increase because it is an inversely proportional relation. Next we have scaling loss in electrostatic forces. So we again consider the case of a parallel plate capacitor but now this is going to undergo charging and discharging. Okay. Now the energy, uh, electrical potential energy which is induced in this parallel plate capacitor shown here is given as half Cv square. U is equal to half Cv square. Where C is the capacitance and V is known as breakdown voltage. So this is a discharging curve for a capacitor. A capacitor undergoing discharge if I plot with respect to distance of the between the parallel plates and the voltage variation this is how I get the curve. So breakdown voltage is basically this maximum voltage which is required for discharge to begin or discharge to be initiated. So if you have uh, this formula half Cv squared let's uh, see what all we can substitute what, how it can be simplified further so capacitance is epsilon naught a by d or epsilon a by d let's substitute for that so it becomes half into epsilon a divided by d next you have v square that is the breakdown voltage square now here comes the thing if the distance between the plates is more than 10 micrometer then you can consider that the breakdown voltage is proportional to the length scale a very important point that breakdown voltage that is the voltage at which the discharge can begin if the parallel plate capacitor distance the distance between the plates is more than 10 micrometer then you can consider that the voltage is proportional to the length scale so what happens here you have half epsilon naught a by d and then b square so a area that is L square, D distance that is L, then again V is proportional to L so it is L square. So you have L square L into L square divided by L that is L power 4 by L or you get it as L cube. So it is proportional to, directly proportional to the cube of the 
length scale energy density or sorry energy uh, electric potential energy uh, for a parallel plate capacitor induced in a parallel plate capacitor is proportional to the cube of the length scale for a simple example if the length scale is reduced by a factor of 10 then the potential energy will reduce by the cube of 10 that is 1000 next we are going to understand scaling loss in heat transfer for this we apply the Fourier's law of heat conduction so we are considered a homogeneous solid here and say this is one side of the surface or the solid and you have then the back side the separation between the front and the back side is given as dx small change a very small gap it is so it is dx and temperature experienced in the front side is capital T and that for the back side is T plus dt that means the temperature difference is dt next you have the heat flowing through from the front side to the back side of the solid or the surface so that is given as dq by dt so you can apply the Fourier's law of heat conduction which says that the rate of heat flow through a so homogeneous solid will be directly proportional to the area of the section and to the temperature difference along the path of the heat flow how do we consider that so we have rate of heat flow dq by ddq is actually representing the heat since it is rate that means with respect to time dq by dt is equal to minus k into a dt by dx so what are these components now k is known as thermal conductivity of the material a is obviously area dt by dx is dt we understood is the difference in temperature dx is the difference in distance between the front and the back side or dt by dx is called as temperature gradient so you have minus ka dt by dx so since this is temperature gradient you can also write it as dou t by dou x now for the proportionality relation we need to just worry about area and this distance dx so dq by dt will be proportional to area divided by dx or area we have l square dx is just a distance so it is l power minus 1 or l, we can, can write it as l square by l or it is l square into l power minus 1 which becomes l power plus 1 that means dq by dt is directly proportional to the length scale this very simply says or implies that any reduction in size will lead to the decrease of the total rate of heat flow so i reduce it by whatever factor the rate of heat flow also reduces by the same factor next we are going to consider scaling laws in sub micrometer regime or basically what we are going to do is we are going to consider an ideal gas station of an ideal gas which is enclosed in a particular container or a particular volume and we take the expression for the thermal conductivity that's given as this formula n into v lambda c by 3 into n a what are these components let's see so k as i said is the thermal conductivity n is the number of gas molecules or particles per unit volume v is the average velocity of the gas molecules or I can say it as mean particle velocity lambda is the average mean free path so what's mean free path mean free path means the distance traveled between the molecules before they undergo collision the minimum distance traveled before they undergo collision next c is the molar specific heat capacity then in the denominator we have three a numeric and then Na which is nothing but the Avogadro number. So for the proportionality relation we need to worry about only two terms that is the average velocity of the molecules and next is the average mean free path. So velocity it's very easy to understand velocity is distance divided by time. So the, if I try to bring in the proportionality relation velocity will be proportional to the distance or length scale 
V is proportional to L. Again, mean free path is a distance. That means it's actually proportional to the length scale. So, what do we get here? We get velocity proportional to length scale and mean free path also proportional to length scale, directly proportional, both of them. So, L into L or it becomes L square. So, thermal conductivity will be proportional to L square. That means if the size is reduced by say a factor of 10, thermal conductivity also reduces by a factor of 10 square which is 100. Now we are going to see uh, a few examples of how properties change and later we understand why they change. So we have taken a few examples here like electrical conductivity, color, strength, weight, all these change at nanoscale. A material which would have been a conductor at large scale at a middle scale can become a semiconductor at nano scale. Now another possibility is some bulk silver if you consider it's, it is actually non-toxic. Non but the moment you bring it to nano scale, you reduce the size and bring it to nano scale, it becomes very toxic that it can even kill viruses upon contact. And now the best example which you can uh, visualize is this. Uh, we have taken a golden ring in meter scale. So this is in meter scale or centimeter scale. In So this is of the order of yellow. Color is of yellow wavelength, right? It produces yellow light. So it looks yellow. But the moment you bring it to nano scale, it looks reddish all the golden atoms look reddish the cluster of atoms look reddish next we have a few more examples like opaque substance can become transparent for example copper so if you take a copper wire obviously you cannot see anything in a bulk stage bring it to nano level it can become transparent next inert materials can become catalyst for an example platinum Stable materials can become compostable. So, for example, aluminium. So, we all use aluminium for lots of applications at home and all, and for many other stuffs. But it's stable at the bulk stage. But if you bring it to uh, nanoscale, it becomes very dangerous. Next, we have solids turning into liquids at room temperature. For example, gold. Yes. So, yes. If I take this ring it does get melted and then only the color you see as reddish if you see it under a microscope okay now comes the main point why all these physical properties change at nano scale what basically happens within the material that all these changes like change of color or change of properties property like something which was non-toxic becoming toxic, something which was a conductor becoming a semiconductor or opaque becoming transparent, all those things, why all these things happen? So the first reason is that when you have smaller size, that means the mass will be very less. So the gravitational force is acting will be very, very negligible. So you know that gravitational force depends heavily on the mass of the substance. And if you have something of very small size, the gravitational force will be very negligible. Then what forces are going to work here? Which kind of forces are going to work? They are the electromagnetic forces. So if you go through my previous lecture series on electromagnetism, you know how complex it is. So electromagnetic forces become very dominant when you consider uh, the material in smaller size. Next important property is quantum confinement. So quantum theory or quantum mechanics has a huge role for the properties to change at nanoscale. So what is quantum confinement? It means that electrons are confined in space or not free to move. That means if I reduce a material in a particular di dimension, say if I go back a few slides before and I talked about different types of materials. If I say when I talked about the thin film where I reduced the material in dimension by less than 100 nanometer in one dimension, what happened actually is 
the movement of electrons in that one dimension got very restricted. They are now become confined in space. Next, we have the contestation of energy taking place or which means that energy levels become discrete or electrons will now exist in discrete energy levels. Next, we have the random molecular motion. This is something introduced, this concept was introduced by Albert Einstein and you would have read about this. So, the random walk problem and all. So, the random molecular motion becomes dominant or it becomes much important when you reduce the size to nanoscale. And next is this increased surface to volume ratio in comparison to bulk materials. So, just a few minutes ago, we in the beginning of the lecture when we talked about scaling loss, we uh, understood how the surface to volume ratio changes. We had it inversely proportional to the length scale. So, surface to volume ratio increases as you reduce the size of the material. So, to give an example for that, I considered here, say I start with one bulk cube for particular size. Say here I am having only one cube, okay, and its area will be of a particular value. Say if I consider one cube of size 1 meter, then collective surface area will be 6 meter square. Now I keep on reducing the size, so within the same volume I am able to put more number of cubes, but at the same time the surface area is going to increase. So this keeps on happening as I reduce the size of the cube. So let's see here mathematically say from 1 meter I reduce it to 0.1 meter. Suppose I can fit in 1000 cubes into the same volume. Surface area increases to 60 meter square. I reduce it further the size becomes 1 centimeter or 0.01 meter. I am getting I am able to put 1 million cubes or the collective surface area becomes 600 meter square. I reduce it further to 1 millimeter size, I am able to put 1 billion number of cubes. Collective surface area becomes 6000 meter square. I reduce the size to nanometer, 1 nanometer. I can put in 10 power 27 cubes, very huge number. And the surface area becomes 6 into 10 power 9 meter square or 6000 kilometer square, a very high value of the surface area. So basically surface area to the volume ratio increases. You can just consider this and see that the volume remains the same but this collective surface area for all these cubes as I reduce the size keeps on increasing. So that's all about nano science in this particular lecture. In the next lecture we will talk about nanotechnology.